say a committee that's uh, established for a specific purpose. Okay. Um, and then next to that would be the board and the commission on the city side. That's a group of people that are officially charged with a particular function. So a commission 
or a board, it's something that's particularly charged. So remember that it's not a nonprofit board because it's lower in the hierarchy of municipalities. More because as we talk, we're going to go where we are. Then the standing committee. That's on the board. It would be your finance, your governance, your personnel. Executive. Executive committee. Those are all assigned standing committees. You'll find those in your bylaws. Hopefully you all know what bylaws is. So we'll get there. And then the ad hoc, and this is where Roy and I, we did really well. It's when necessary or needed. We're going to be an ad hoc group for today. Tomorrow, we don't, you're not part of it. So then the overview, this is more information than you ever need, but it really, oh, I pulled this off another slide, so I didn't get my thing. Okay, so there's on the nonprofit sector, and I use nonprofits and not for profits. It's not wrong, it's not right, it's just, just um, there are three. There's a private sector, which is business and industry. There's the public, which is government and public education system, and then the nonprofit, which is charitable organizations, membership of organizations, associations, and professional societies. And I think it's just, you know, the as as the, the um, private sector is business and industry, they exist to produce a profit for their own owners. The um, public sector is the government; they exist. To serve the public good, that's how I interpret that. And then the nonprofit sector exists to serve a social purpose, a contingency, or a cause. Kind of gives you that relationship. Now nonprofits don't mean you don't make money. So you're still you're still there. You're just not making business money for yourself. You make it for you. So then you get to all of this list. When we think about it, I don't know if the Greek is in there, but it's just huge. You know, I think nonprofits run the world. When you think of how many people actually are there and how many are involved, Tammy serves on 24 of them. I bet you they're right there. <laughs> Every one of them. Is there somebody else that you see that? Kim, and going back to the difference between nonprofit and for profit, would a good example of that be a for profit? Uh, so, both nonprofit and for profit are all about, I mean, you need to make money. Obviously, people are going to make money. But the difference is in for profit, you have shareholders who receive income or, an owner. or owners who receive some level of income through dividends or whatever. So they're making profit individually. Yes, and for nonprofits, you're you're sharing your wealth through either your services or your costs. So there are staff and you have lots of that. Really, you're trying to share. I think it's the big group. In my mind, it's the big group. But there are a lot of big groups. Okay, so let's see. So for the overview of the nonprofit sector, um, they're also called the voluntary sector. I think you know that from out there. An independent sector, a third sector, or the social sector. So we are tax exempt nonprofits. Are uh, those the code? Judy can help us with that. The 501 C's. They're not required, we're not required to pay. I guess I should say that. Um, federal and corporate income. There are several um, that don't have to pay sales tax as well. Churches, um, the four that were uh, congressionally chartered, so that would be Red Cross, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Salvation Army. Those four do not have to pay sales tax, so they were congressionally chartered. We have to pay sales tax. Um, many others do, but that really helps. There's 25 different categories. I didn't realize there were. But thank you, Chris, for helping me. There are 25 C's. Have it. Uh, the most common are the C3s, so everybody who serves on a board, minus the chamber, they're pretty much 
Love Foundation. They're awesome. That would be the religious parts. Some churches are, have 501c3, some do not. Just kind of a quirky little thing. The, 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 um, the first one, pray, that's the C6. That's what the chamber is, it's a C6. So if you belong to an accountant association, a legal bar association, those are C6s usually, you're paying membership to it. That's why it's a C6. Uh, C4s are the social welfare foundations are C4s. I'm pretty sure you are. I think you're a C4. Make sure you don't lie to the cop. Yeah, I, I think that the foundation, but don't hold me to that one because that's one that I'm not positive on. Social organizations are C7s. So I, I'm wondering, is Twin Fitness a C7? Or is it because it's a city? It's not. It's because it's a city. It's under the city. I think we're C1. So I wonder what 1718 would be. Oh. Um, this, so the YMCA actually is a C3, but could be a C7. And it all depends on what their, their terminology want to be, what they want to be given. And each one has a different specific piece to help you out with it. If you want to give charitable gifts, though, C3 is the way to go. Now, this one makes me feel really good. Very good. There's 1.4 million nonprofits. Volunteer, 25. 25% volunteer. Okay, so we don't need to say 25.1. Both Masons. Okay. I'm telling you, Mason B. Croft and Mason Hoy are close. They work together on two boxes. They're, they're the same people sometimes. And um, there's an average of 137 hours per year volunteering. Tammy, you did that in two weeks. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, if you just think about that, that's you know a little more than two hours a week, which you're giving. Almost three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours. Three hours. Have you calculated and thought, oh, that's more than what I want to give? And um, that's from board source. And, and if I don't recommend board source at least a hundred times, board source is one. Boardsource.org. I'm a member, so if you really need to copy something that says become a member and agree to have the money for that for nonprofit mentality. Call me and I'll send you something. It has some really, really good stuff in there. That's where I got my uh, most current data from. And then um, what they talk about. Uh, statistic. S T A T T I S T I T I S Our office is, is lived on data and research. But there it is. Okay, so yay, you say yes, we're searching for volunteers. So as a new board member, but what did you say yes to? Not my phone. Um, a board and trust committee member has an authority or certain responsibilities or terms and commitments. So let's kind of run through that, and then I'm going to give Lori a um, Your authority, sometimes you want to check and make sure what authority you actually have. You know, we talked about as a committee, you don't have much authority. Your board is where your authority is. So if you're a power-hungry person, the committee is not the place for you to sit. It's a great stepping point, 
But if you want to make really big decisions, you're going to serve on the board or on the city council. That's the level that you want to be. And I, I love doing this people. Helene and I served on the first facilities board for the city. And we thought we were gung ho. We were going to get so much knowledge. We were going to learn how to do this. We were, the King Center had just been built. And we were trying to set the, the rent figures and all that. Silly us. We worked more than those 137 hours, got this lovely, lovely report, and we thought, okay, eat it, it's good. No, it's not good. <laughs> it goes to Public Works. Yep, Public Works first. Then it gets approved by Public Works on the city end. It then goes to the city council for approval. It took us six weeks to get our six weeks worth of work done, and just getting to approval. So it all depends on where you want to work. If you're a good worker bee and you like to get down in the trenches and you like to do data research and you really like to know, because Lindsay likes to ask, um, a committee is a great place to be. If you don't want to take all that authority or a little concern, a committee is a great place to be. Trust make decisions, as we've learned. So if you want to serve on the Martin Luther King Trust, which I think is just as good. Um, they make decisions, but only so far. We had a, a budget that's been approved by the city council, like the Rocky Trust the Pain, like the Batfish Trust. Same, we have, uh, you know, what are these trusts that are in there? Airport? Is Airport a trust no. or a board? Uh, they are a board. Medical uh, Authority? Is that a trust? Medical, uh, the Muskogee Medical Center Authority is a trust, the Muskogee Industrial Trust, the Muskogee Redevelopment Authority, the Muskogee Medical Center, excuse me, the Muskogee Municipal Authority. Uh, we have, I think, 12 different trusts, and the Roxy Trust has now changed to the Muskogee Tourism Trust. So it's a board, not a trust? No, it is a trust. It's a trust. So on the trust, you can make the decisions of the day-to-day -day decisions. Usually you have staff or committees that make the day-to-day -day decisions of the trust. The next level up would be making the more finer decisions. Kind of the, the cloud decisions. And then the city council would have to ratify some of them. Some of those they don't have to do. Um, but it's just kind of an argument. And on boards, on nonprofit boards, you have committees, you have ad hoc committees, you have standing committees. They send the recommendations so you know when you sit on a board and they bring the committee reports to the, the board meeting itself. I'm talking about profits. It has to be ratified. So that ratification comes from the board that's really just approving what the committee is doing. Here in the mud. Yes, sir. Question. <clears throat> so are committees important? And if so, how are they important? Well, they're certainly important that you don't want your 10 member board to do everything. So you put your experts on the committees. They're the so, workforces. Yes, so think about finance, because I know everybody loves finance. Amber and I are probably the two geekiest ones here on finance. But we love going through numbers and seeing it. I don't think Corinna loves numbers. Her arms are full of chicken tail stuff. So you don't want her on our finance committee of the board. So your finance committee works on the budget it's been proposed and already adopted. You're reviewing the financial statements. This goes further, I think it's our third session. Financial. So you would review your financial statements and then you send the recommendations to your board. So your committee, or an event, event committee. Do you want every 10, 10 to 20 member board member to serve, do all the planning, and then the board just has an event? It also recruits more volunteers. If you're trying to build succession and leadership, that kind of gives clears them up. Good and better example. You need to uh, update your bylaws. I am not an attorney, I've already shared, I'm not an attorney. And that's one thing I, I, I can geek out a little bit, but that is not something I want to do. I'll call Roy Turner. Roy Turner! <laughs> You've called me that before. <laughs> Roy Turner, uh, but you call Roy and you say, Roy, I need some more help and guidance on the bylaws. We don't like our quorums. We don't like something. Uh, a new marijuana one. 
the marijuana laws came out, we had to have some discussion. I needed a bylaw that really was more of a policy, but I wanted to have some conversation about it in the bylaws. It's either really be cool or I'm sorry. So I call Roy and say, hey, you know, will you meet with our bylaw committee? Because our entire board doesn't care about that's, that's why. So you need the workforces to do the, the, the work at hand. Unless you have a very working board and not a governing board. And I didn't even think of that anyway. So let's talk about that as a responsibility. Some boards are working boards and some boards are governing boards. If you're a small nonprofit, no staff, oh, under $100,000 budget a year. That's about about 200, 250 is where they would start adding staff. They would take over. Um, if you only have $100,000, you're going to pay half of that in salaries and benefits and taxes. So you have to make more if you're going to go. So, um, so you're on a completely volunteer board. So now, Corinne is now the PR person. We'll have talked about. Stacy's now the. Uh, you're the treasurer. Whew. Carlene is now the HR person. You don't have staff, so everybody's doing this as a volunteer. So your board is really, and then Angela's going to help us all do events. So in a larger organization, you may have an event director, you may have a program director, you may have a finance person, you may have a communication person that can help. Um, but if you're a true working board and you don't have enough volunteer staff, your volunteer staff. So that's when your hierarchy has to hit, hit with committees. And I really think that's a uh, term. Check in your bylaws. If you haven't become really good friends with your bylaws on your board, this is the time to do that. You never want non closed terms. My term is three years. I've done it three years. I can max out two terms. I serve as a board chair, I may serve as two years, I may serve as one year, I may serve as a three year board chair. Um, but they should be staggered because you want to build succession. Terms are really, really important. When you look at your bylaws, make sure that they close. And there's a reason why Oklahoma legislature has term limits and why Lewis County doesn't have term limits. That's, that's the high end. The low end, you don't want to be the founder of a nonprofit and be there 40 years from now and still think that everything can be ran the same way that you ran it. That becomes horrible. Horrible, horrible. The idea is that you want to bring fresh blood in, so you want to do succession planning. We talked about that. Commitment, you want to make sure that you're committed to what you're serving on. You're not just there just because. We'll have that a little further. And then the immunity and civil liberty. Is your liability. That's your turn. Yes. So notice uh, on the first slide there was a reference to 86 OS. It's actually 76. So we can, we can fix that. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. So uh, one of the questions that you may be thinking to yourself is why do I want to volunteer for a nonprofit? What about my liability? Do I assume anything by joining this organization? And to some extent, the legislature has created some immunity to encourage people to be involved in nonprofits. And so if you look at this is uh, the citation for Title 76, Oklahoma Statute, Section 31, and it provides for immunity uh, for civil liability if you're acting in good faith within the scope of what your authority is while you're volunteering. So if you're a volunteer board member and your job is, and we'll talk about job descriptions at one of these sessions, but if your job on a board is to govern and to oversee and not to run the day-to-day -day operations because you have an executive director, if you go in and you start um, telling staff what to do, that's outside your job description, so that's outside your purview. So to some degree, you give up your liability. Uh, for example, if you uh, run off an employee and you do so for discriminatory purposes, the easiest example I can think of, um, then you're, you wouldn't have immunity from liability. Uh, 
Um, you also wouldn't have immunity if you did something in bad faith. So as a board member, let's say you're on the finance committee and you worked in concert with the finance director to embezzle money. You're not going to have liability. Or you're not going to have immunity for that. So you're going to have liability. So um, the important thing within the statute is that while you individually may have immunity for your good faith acts, which may give rise to liability, your board may not. So uh, let's say you as a board member were involved in a decision where you voted to do something, and that decision gave rise to a lawsuit later on. Well, the organization can still be sued, but you wouldn't be personally liable, okay? The organization may be. So the other question is, well, does this provide complete immunity? Uh, let's assume I'm always acting in good faith. Does this provide complete immunity? No. Because this is in Title 76, which relates to torts, which are wrongs to other people. So let's use another example where you may not have immunity in good faith, and why you have the reason, why, where there's a reason for having vehicle insurance, and that is if you have a contractual liability. So let's say that uh, as a uh, volunteer board member, you sign um, a document which uh, allows the board to get involved. That document may have a clause that says you're personally guaranteed. And so if that's the case, while you're limited to liability from your liability for tort, you have contractual liability for that. So it's always important to read everything you sign. I know you should learn this, but it's one of those things where everything I've learned on doing kindergarten. Read everything before you can think to it. Uh, because there may be some liability issues there that you're not aware of. Um, payroll is going to be another one. If for some reason you are, uh, as part of your job description, involved in uh, approving or somehow being involved in the approval of payroll, you may have some liability from the federal and the tax uh, issues that may come around, such as from F FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, so you may have some liability on the federal. This is only limited protection that's provided by the state, and so it'll protect you from liability as it arises under state law. It would not for any issues related to federal law. Taxation issues, uh, those are the big ones, payroll, uh, retirement issues for under ERISA, things like that. So that is why liability, this immunity is helpful, but it is not absolute, nor is it complete which is why DNO insurance is always important. So any board that you agree to set on, find out if there is DNO insurance, DNO directors and officers. Um, and so it'll provide some level of, well, it'll provide the additional protection for liability acts. Now, if you're on a uh, city board, uh, number one, the decisions that you make are advisory. So they're subject to approval of the city council. Second, under uh, state statute, uh, any decision made by a member within the municipality is uh, indemnified by the municipality itself. So if you're on a board or commission, you are going to have complete uh, liability unless you do something that is in bad faith. So you have immunity. Any questions? Yes, Gary. <laughs> don't be, don't be. Okay, I've been in nonprofits for a long time and there has been very limited issues, and number one, somebody who wants to sue you doesn't want to sue you personally because they want the big bucks. And unless you are part of the um, one of the major foundations and are the benefactor of it, who also sits on the board, you shouldn't be able to have a board. I'm going to leave that board out there. Remember to go back to your how you're sued. Or you just want to do it right now on it? Yeah, we can do it right now. Well, it's up there. So we talked about uh, being a uh, member of a city board commission. So uh, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be quite frank about it. Uh, we have the same 50 people who join every year. We are grateful that they're willing to do that. But occasionally, wouldn't it be nice to have new ideas, um, a more diverse group of folks who come together to so that's one of the reasons why over the last couple of years we've been pushing this so hard. Please get involved, please get involved, and we'll tell people that you know to get involved. 
So um, Kim and Kim and uh, Angela had asked me to put a uh, slide up to talk about how to get involved in a city board, what you can do, and how to find out information. Because I'll be honest with you, our city website at this current point is being it's being redesigned, but at its current point is quite terrible. And I look at it every day about 40 times, and sometimes I can't find stuff. So if you've never gone to it, I understand why you can't find anything. So that's why I wanted to uh, have this slide. So first thing you need to do is you already know what your interest is. So find out if there's a board commission that cultivates that interest. Are you interested in urban planning? Are you interested in parks and recreation? Are you interested in uh, granting variances? Uh, sitting as a quasi-judicial board? Are you interested in health and wellness? Are you interested in uh, the animal shelter? Are you interested in facilities? Are you a construction person? Um, so there's a, literally something for everyone. And so figure out what you're interested You know what you're interested in, so figure out what board uh, we have that would cultivate those interests. Second, be aware of the length of commitment. Kim talked about a uh, term of three years, and then you can have another term. So our terms are anywhere from three to seven. So sometimes it can be quite a commitment. So if you're gung-ho and you're like, yes, I'm in, be fine about a seven-year term. If you're like, that may be interesting, but I don't really know, be weary of a seven-year term because you don't want to jump in and everybody gets to know you. You start to go to the work and go, this is too much or this is more of a commitment. So be aware of the term. So third, and most important, find out when the board meets. Does that work with your schedule? You know, are you an eight to five person who comes to the clock? And so if you are, you're not gonna be able to make a 10 a.m. meeting. And so don't join a board that does that. Uh, if you work in the evenings, don't take, or, or you have your kids that you're taking for soccer practice or whatever in the evening, don't join a board that meets at 5 o'clock. And so be aware of your own schedule and be aware of when the board meets because most of these uh, have had the same schedule for, I wouldn't say 100, 100 years, but 50, <laughs> maybe. Uh, now they can be changed, but it's, it's uh, you don't really want to jump in doing that. Um, and then determine if there's a benefit. So most of our boards are nine year boards. And so uh, on the list uh, of boards and commissions where you can find out what they do is when they meet. It'll have a term and it'll also have who currently sits on there and when the term expires. And if there's nothing there, it'll say vacant. And that means there's no position on the board. So if you pull up the planning commission board and the next vacancy is in 2024, then maybe you should look at something else if you're not the board. That's what I think. And so um, once you determine all that, you download the uh, board and commission application from the city's website. You fill it out and you submit it to the city clerk. And you can bring it in in person if you're downtown or you can mail it in. We don't care. We're easy. Um, and then um, just make sure that it gets there because a lot of times our spam filters will catch it. So if you haven't received, if you didn't get a response that says, thank you, got it, We'll be in touch or something. Follow up and say, did you get my email? Um, and then once you have that, all of you who live in the city have a council meeting. Reach out to that person and ask them to respond to your application because that's going to get it moving much quicker. Because here's what city staff does: we get applications for boards and commissions. And so let's say uh, we get Angela's application to be on the planning. So we look on the planning commission, we decide which council member has that appointment, and we send them the application. They look at it. Sometimes they'll tell us, let's go forward. Sometimes they won't say anything. And sometimes we need to uh, ask them a couple of times, or they'll say, um, I want to meet with Angela and find out what her skill set is with regard to planning. That's more rare, uh, but it does happen. And so um, always have a council member uh, in your corner who's going to advance your application. And that's easy to do. Even if they don't know you, they want people to serve. And so they're always willing to help and always willing to move forward. But it just takes that phone call or email to reach out to them. 
and also on our website, you can find out the council members <coughs> for what we work. And it doesn't even have to be the board. You can reach out to them. Um, send them an email, a text, a phone call, any one of them say, hey, I'm interested. And that will trigger them to, to start moving in here. Uh, because the appointments are all theirs. We simply, as staff, facilitate the information of the appointments. So I talked about reading the commission list, filling out the application. The question is where you get it. So if you go to our website, citymuskogee.org, you can also do citymuskogee.com. I think we also have it on net. Whichever one you type in there. And then at the top of the bar, government. Pull down the government bar, and it'll have boards and commissions. Scroll down the sheet. It'll say list of boards and commissions, application for boards and commissions. And so those are updated usually about every six weeks to two months. And so they're always very timely. And so when you pull it up, the, uh, app, the list is in PDF format. In the bottom right-hand corner will tell you the black button. And so uh, scroll through that. It has, a, it has all the boards and commissions. It has a description when they meet. Uh, who else is on the board? You may decide, ooh, there's somebody that I, you know, have always been impressed with. I'd love to get to know them better and, you know, sit on the board with them. Uh, and so they'll tell you who's on there in their terms, and they'll also tell you uh, whether there's a vacant seat. The other important thing that I forgot to mention is it'll tell you the location of the meeting. So um, let's say you have a board that meets at lunch, and you work downtown. So maybe you want to sit on the board uh, that meets at City Hall because it's close. But instead, if you only have an hour lunch, you wouldn't want to join the airport board because that's a good 15-minute drive out there and then a 15-minute drive back if you're working downtown. So look at the logistics of serving on that board before you submit your application. Uh, but anyway, um, we really, really are looking for folks who are interested. And Tammy, if you sit on there, then um, and do you sit on any city boards? The foundation, but not any of the, okay. The foundation, then that's a, that's a little, uh, little bit. Um, what about the residency? Residency, uh, with the exception of the airport board, uh, you do have to live within the city limits to serve on the boards. Um, the, air, the airport board has, I think, three positions that you can live in the county. Um, but not anywhere further than that. Um, and there has been some questions of whether that's a good idea or not, uh, but it's been that way forever. We haven't seen any change in that. And so um, that's kind of what the, the residence requirements are effectively the same as everywhere else. Heather has a question. Yeah. Please. I would like to hear And want to join the board that is paid for by the board. Yeah. Um, there are at least two positions on the board that we can actually apply to be board of trustees or chairman. And the city has to approve those positions. The city has to approve the board. She's got the notes on the phone. Resident to sit on the board. I don't know what that means. They have to change the trust administrator. Because you're talking about the tourism board. Mm -hmm. So the trust has to vote to change its indenture, and then the city council has to vote for that. Has to ratify. Has to ratify. So I'm not sure what what you're talking about. So we're getting a bill for the turnout. So where does that number start? At the individual trust. So any member of that trust can put anything on the indenture. And then putting on the indenture. To amend, to amend the bylaws to um, change the residency requirement effectively. And that was successfully done at the Batfish, correct? Uh, I believe it was at the Batfish. I know it was done at the airport. Carlene was on that. Carlene was part of that. So it would go just so that it would go to the trust to a trustee member that would propose it, not a non trustee. Not a non-member. Not a non-member. So a, a trustee member would put it on the agenda. It would be a, not just a majority or a nope. Okay. Just a majority, yeah. Because how old are we talking about? Uh, 
Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so that would be you have to copy. So, yeah, bylaws are two thirds and indenture is two thirds. So, it is a super majority. Yes. Thank super you, majority. Kim Lynch. For yes, that. good for Kim Lynch. Good for Kim Lynch. <laughs> Not very often. Yeah, so two thirds uh, majority. And then uh, once that is approved, then it, then goes, it goes to, to city, council. city council. And that was the same uh, mechanism that uh, happened with uh, when uh, Perlene was on the airport board and they decided. Now, that's not a trust, it's a board, but it was established by ordinance. And so the airport board voted to uh, allow membership in the county. And uh, once the board voted on that change, then it went to city council to approve the ordinance. Perlene was there to speak in favor of it as the, the chairman at the time. So it was approved, and I think I'm sure that by now they've appointed somebody from in the county. But that's that's how it works. And that's really how, how nonprofit boards work as well as that is it comes from the members. So this is why a committee is so important, is that a committee wants to change something, they propose it, it goes to the board. Um, Boards follow Robert's rules. Most every board I know follows his rules. Or that's the session that you're here. Um, I do sit on one that does agree with a lot of people. Well, but you need to it's the, well, it's the state. I sit on the state. They're like, we don't, we don't follow that. <laughs> so it's really no okay, so going on. <laughs> recommendation would be to, to follow Robert's yes. rules. So Robert's rules on voting. You notice the regular, just a regular majority is 54%. Why I, I teased about super majorities, I can never remember which one is which, but I do know that if you're changing a law, it has to be super majority. Two thirds. Yeah, good catch. <laughs> Not very often, but thank you. Any other questions? Is this muddy, clear as mud for you all? So you don't really want to be on all your city here. Yes, you do. <laughs> but Heather can't be on it right now because. She lives outside. Although she was on, now this is, uh, we were on tourism together for the chamber. But does the chamber require city residents, or does it require board residents? For our business? board, mm -hmm. it's because you're part of that business, and um, you do not have residency. We do not have residency requirements. It all depends on, on what you're applying to. I mean, I can talk about it again. Well, I don't know. I have a question at the back of the room. <laughs> Snore back. That's the good time. I should have them to talk about, remember, there's water and chocolate and pens. And, and board applications. Board yeah. appli I didn't bring any board applications. And Tammy Tracy was one of our force and Pearsons. And uh, was not here today. But she is the city clerk. So if you have any questions on that, please call Tammy. She would love to have you. Anyway, so on recruiting, whose job is it selecting members? This is another reason for a good committee. The board does, executive committee, nominating committee, and staff. Um, I put staff on there because staff members can always suggest, but it really needs to be the board. Now on NBNs, I mean, some people have lots of different standing committees. Our executive committee is our nominating committee. I think you can go a little bit no. Ours is different. I don't think that it would help. Okay. It's part of the board. Does anybody else have two clean teams? And there, there's good and bad about that. If your executive committee serves as your nominating committee, unless your executive committee is very inclusive, and very um, diverse. You tend to get the same all the time. That, that's a bad thing. I'm just gonna talk about diversity, but part of that challenge is, I can't really say the three words. <laughs> um, always trying to make sure that you have somebody who's, you know, I don't want everybody sitting around who's Kim Lynch. I don't want everybody on the board like me. I would be so boring. I would not want anybody to argue with or discuss me with me. Um, and I don't want lots of yes people. So when you're serving on a board, you want people with different opinions, you want people with different social statuses, you want people from different diversities and ethnicity, you want people 
of different ages. You know, succession happens for a reason. And there's really, um, you want full faith and broad spectrum. You want to reflect whatever your community is being served. So for NBN, we serve Southeast. Um, we want to make sure that it, it serves all. So we're looking at the socioeconomic areas too. We want people in poverty. We want people that are very rich. We want people that are, are from urban. And we'll talk about that diversity. We don't want everybody looking just like that. So um, when you recruit, that's you do the same thing. It's great to have your best friend with you. It's great. That's a, a committee. It's a great committee spot, but maybe not on the board. Because if you only have a board of 10 or 12, and you've got your best friend, and you both think exactly alike, you've got 10 people that you have to cross the top. And that's really the area where we expand on that, too, where you're not only committed to an article and have that as a nominating committee and then before the entire board chair, but the whole committee takes into consideration and advice from the staff, and so having that staff is really important. Um, so then you identify current and future leaders of the board. Um, and then where do you find your board members? This was just some ideas. So the telephone committee, I love, and, and being past board chair of United Way, I love the community assessment group. I love that hierarchy. You know, the first group goes out and they look at all the nonprofits that are going to be are going to be funded, hopefully funded. That group is a large group. From that selection process, then they come and serve on a board or a committee, and then they have well knowledge of everybody. I love that. That's probably one of the best board succession plans. Just like uh, the Sydney Spoken Foundation does the same thing. Not always, but most people serve on committees. And then we go to the board. It gives you a well-roundedness, and you kind of know what's going on. Um, I did not do that on the United Way board. So I knew some of the funded partners from the previous lives, but I didn't know current partners. Had I had followed that, that rank and file system, I would know everybody, and it would really give me better decision making because I wouldn't go to my biases. That's that's why I like that. That's why I like the foundation as well. So that's why you have committees or special events. Have somebody who loves to do special events, move them up to a committee, a committee to the board. They've got a broad spectrum versus poof, you're on the board. Um, so we pull through that. Volunteer leadership must go be best practices. I was on leadership board. Who's been like this? You have applications for <laughs> <laughs> And then social activities. This is my plug only because if you go to a special event, oh, by the way, dueling in the gi on October 7th, dueling pianos by Lisa by neighbors, dueling neighborhoods is going to happen. So, of course, you want Yay. Angela's already got two tickets and I took two. Uh, but you know what? You sit by somebody and you talk with them and you say, How is this beneficial? You know, when you're at an event, you have the event, you have the material there to know why I really need to teach. The teachers, the teachers, you know, we talk about United Way. This is the perfect spot. If you don't have an event or if you're having a, an event, make sure you talk about why you're doing it, besides it being fun. Okay. So that'll give you some of the recruiting. Any other ideas on recruiting? You know, going to your accountant and needing your taxes set. Standing in line in the grocery store, how many times have you been bored stiff? Well, about the past two years, so. Pre-COVID, when you're standing in line in the grocery store. Now it's different. Um, uh, standing in line. When I have little kids, standing in line for the teachers or doing the teacher class conversations or events. You're just talking to somebody. You know, they're not just like you, but they have similar interests. Or I got more good board members than 
I'm sure Heather will admit to this, being a soccer parent. You're there for four hours of practice, six hours of eating. I love them, I love them, but you know. You bring your chair, because you're gonna have to make friends. You know, you're sitting at a baseball team, you're gonna have to make friends. Because you're sitting there for so long, that's a good time to talk. You're at dance class, and kids are dancing, and you're sitting, you're either sitting in the car reading a book, or you're gonna talk to somebody. Use that time wisely while you're boarding them, and start recruiting. I think it goes the other way when you are getting recruited as a board member to be fully transparent. Like, I always use this as, as a PTA at the school. I will be on it, but don't ask me to make goodie bags. If you need pizza ordered, I'm all over that. Like, I don't have time to stuff 30 goodie bags for the house. You're not going to make So being fully transparent when you are being recruited is key also of what your skill sets are. I agree. Because don't ask me to make the cookies on Tuesday afternoon. I would love to do that. <laughs> Don't judge me. But water tastes really good, maybe. <laughs> okay, so when you're learning about the board, and if you have not been recruited, but you're still trying to think about it, this is the reading list that um, most nonprofits should have at their fingertips for you. Uh, I did not a couple of mine. Um, your bylaws. That's your Bible in your mind, in your mind. That tells you that was a state document. The bylaws go to the state of your articles of incorporation. So they have to be, they have to be clean, they have to be concise. They have to have the mission and the purpose in there. They have to be able to give you some direction. Those are your marching orders to get you where you're going. The cookies. Any more me? They're they're tedious, they're boring, but you know what? It tells you what roles you play. It tells you what kind of meetings you have. It tells you that you can remote. I don't know how many of you knew that you couldn't do remote meetings until the governor did the emergency. But prior to that, I can't at NBN do a. And they took it away. Let's let's not let that unknown. They took it away too. Right. They can't see. Board policies. These are the things that say you can and can't do. This gives you some direction. The bylaws are really the, the policies are the map. The bylaws are your action, your, your Bible of what you can do. Your policies are your roadmap. What you can do and what you can't do. Um, board biographies. Not everybody puts those out there, but it's a really good thing to share. I love United Ways puts it out there, Green Country does that, they, they highlight a board member or a staff member, I think that's wonderful. People want to know who's serving on your board. Uh, it also gives you a great chance to spy, of course you don't spy on people, but if you're being asked to serve on a board and you want to know, I look at board biographies. Why do they really want me there? You know, am I the instigator to be part of that group or am I the person to fix it and why are they there just to be a part of it? Am I just a good cog in there? Why are they asking you? And I'll ask that question. You know, why do you want them? Um, prior years, annual audit. Some people are really protective of that. I don't care. I didn't bring mine over because we the IRS are fighting right now. So, and you have just been chained in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Not in jail, they just said they never received 2018, so I have it in my hand, but you're standing. The IRS is going to be on our problems, just in case anybody has the same problems right now. 2018 is a really, they just sent me a $42,000 fine. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Let me go after them for that one. 2019, you know, because they changed those years, and IRS is sending all sorts of letters to everybody. Don't panic. Please don't panic about that one, though, because it's really silly. And 2020s are due, or have been due, if you're filed an extension. And they're already sending letters out. I think the IRS had nothing better to do for a while, and so now they're just, they're all coming back in the office and they're all going crazy. Do you, do you agree? I mean, I don't know. This past four months, I've had seven letters from the IRS. I'm not going to share my prior years. I have no office. That's fine. A budget. 
your board should work with the staff. Normally how I work, which is I create a budget. I take it to my finance committee. My finance committee then reviews it. Then it gets proposed from the finance committee to the board. The board then adopts it. That's the effect. It's a convention. It doesn't change unless there's a huge event or a big loss of grants or we're so grant funded that our budget does this. And the other thing with the NBN budget is I do not put all the grants in my budget because I don't know whether they're going to be So I'm ultra conservative on dollars. And then your annual report, which we have started doing more video. Thank you for Lindsay, Robert. We do ours all video and digital. I don't think we have a printed copy. We may have one. I did send some to the city council. NBN it has a contract with the city, and so we have to present every year to the city council. I give them a truly paper copy. I am not slip paper. I don't spend any money on that. But it looks really choice. I think it's on our website. Please look. It's amazing work. Good work. Yeah, my goal, Macy, is not to brag too much about what we did. I'm trying hard. Anyway, this next one is really kind of weird, and I loved it because it's kind of neat. These are 15 essential leadership positions every nonprofit should have. Now, if you don't click into those, I have the answers on there. So, a tactical flexibility leader, a diversity and inclusion. These guys sat with me and they went, what? What? Yeah, you stand for? what? Will you, can you figure it out? A chief storytelling officer. I love that. Poof. You can be a chief storyteller. Uh, you got some of them are pretty easy to pick up. What? This is from Forbes. This is what they told you you needed to have. And they considered them staff positions. Yeah, who can afford it? <laughs> so, you see those, uh, those silly names? Y'all got them kind of in your name, in your eyes? So, I'm going to go to the real one. So, I should have done this side by side. The tactical flexibility leader became the, who, the identifying challenges to the Diversity inclusion executive. That's the racial and health executive. Boy, you're looking at his face. Uh, chief storytelling and people inspiration connectivity person. Does it kind of fit for you? The membership member experience leader, and it goes on and on and on. These I can do. Well, was the vice president of technology, otherwise known. A love that I really liked, which was just kind of different, that was a new media ecologist. What a name for somebody. You're always looking for new titles for people. Otherwise known as PR 2.0 for Media. Yeah, media. This is media. Different ideas on different content for people. This will help you look for different board members as well. Maybe you're looking we all need help, we all need mental health discussions, but that's for me as well on number nine. It might be nice to have somebody who has some mental health and counseling skills too. These revenue officers are not supposed to be revenue. They don't want to forget the call. This gives you your thoughts and in working in that to understand. The next piece is the matrix of the diversity. When you're doing your, and you have that piece of paper on your don't you have it. The blue going this way would be your names of your, your board members. So, So is your favorite thing finance fundraising? Not really. Finance management personal policy. So you would just put a one and 
I can send the template over to you. It really helps you pick out board numbers. Uh, those are probably the skill set, the best skill set for this one. And then comes age. We don't want everybody really nice aging can become nice next <laughs> But it, do, it really helps you build the, the spectrum of what you're needing and what you're looking at. And then for me, this was because I have stolen the scene for so many years. I really don't think it's going to be good for me. But we're on small communities. And then ethnicity, religion. Oh, look at my non binary got covered. <laughs> when, when, when I proposed this, this I've used this exact form for more years than I need to. Uh, religion, we used to argue about, why do you really need to know about people's religion? But then, my friend Lori said, what about Catholic Church? We don't say what we feel or not feel. Gospel Rescue Mission. There are certain organizations that their religion is very important to their purpose of their organization. So that was It really does help give you a, a really good broad, broad spectrum. I know Curly you use something very similar, but you can't, you know, the problem is when you're doing employment, you can't do this. If you're doing a board member, you can't do this. So think of that. And I think it's important to add to whatever specific mission your organization is. So this Lake Air United Way, we don't want everyone from Muskogee or everyone from Tahlequah or the chamber, we don't want everyone, we don't want all bankers. Um, so I think customizing it to that specific board is important. Okay, if you just plug into the bottom of it something that you just I agree with that. I think it's a great guide that like whatever your mission is, like if you're an arts consultant, you you know you're gonna want to pull in those pieces that would be specific to and what that. media or what art media they're doing. Right. Sure. And so for us we would look at our community and what we serve All of that, but also that we're representing everyone in our community as well. And so, so perhaps in this criteria, you can right. some of those that you just add to great eyes. Great eyes. But it also, but small businesses, small, right. small, Absolutely. zero to ten, zero to five. I don't know what your criteria is on you know, small versus big. But, but plugging those in so that you see that all 20 of your board members are not male over 60. Our bankers. So, these are things. <laughs> so, then liability. Uh, as a board member, this is, this is what Roy really got into is a deductible uh, attendance. Just because you're not there does not release you of liability. Attend. You know, and, and we talk a lot about three structure three structure out. You attend you don't attend a board meeting in three board meetings. Some bylaws require you to be off the board, but you still are liable whether you're in attendance or not. So if you're not going to be able to attend, resign or at least ask for minutes to find out what's going on. I mean, there are circumstances beyond everybody's control. I'm not saying get rid of people, I'm saying Make sure that if you're a board member, <laughs> Perlene is laughing under her mask because I know exactly who she's talking about. Um, but still make sure that they understand that they're liable to an infraction. That, if, if you learn one thing, just because you're on 24 boards, God love you, you're going to have to be, you're liable for all 24 boards. Financial. You know that when you see an audit, it has to be board approved. If your audit was not board approved, shame on you. 
because your audit really will write you your, your 990, which has a little spot on the list that checks and says, my board reviewed this and it was approved. Last page. Um, that's probably the two most important things that you have to do. You have to make sure that the organization is stable. And one of the stabilities, stability, One of the stabilities is making sure that you're financially responsible. So if you haven't seen an audit and you haven't approved your 990, shame on you. Financial reporting. Good boards give you monthly financials or at least quarterly financials. If you only need quarterly, quarterly financials work. In an MBN world, in us, we need to. We have to approve our grants end of July, so that one, our financials need to change dramatically. So that's something that needs to be done. And then you're charitable. You know, you're giving this is charitable twice. We, we didn't talk about it. Charitable is there's the Secretary of State form that you send in if you're a fundraiser. You have to do that annually. But also your charitable gifts. As a board member, you're going to give money to your board. So not so charitable in that part, but my mindset was charitable. Make sure that you turn in your, your fundraising form that gets stamped. It's $25. Usually I do it during with my 990. It's kind of like a checklist that I follow. Legally, the Secretary of State, um, it's good. We all know how government works. Even in our city. It's good to check on that years or so to make sure that they haven't lost your EIN number. I, I'm working with somebody who has two EIN numbers. They shouldn't have two EIN numbers. It depends on the nature of HIPAA. But you shouldn't, well, that's another whole story. If Lori was here, I'd give you a whole story. But you should only have one EIN number. That's your employee identification number, EIN. But it's also your, you use that for your tax ID number. You use it for everything. That little 73-16303. Uh, that number for grants, for everything in the world, for your 990s, for your 941s, for everything, you have that, that EIN number. Even for businesses, they have a EIN. Make sure that the Secretary of State doesn't change it. It does happen more times than I can care to. Property as far as board liability. I put this in here before other words that came to the public, but if you're a board and you're a working board, perfect example, I'm using the King's Trust because I'm we're the general managers for the King's Trust. Our mowers mow. However, we have these tall leaves, tall leaves, the ones that we have, that is snake ridden. Tall big grass. I like snakes, but I don't love snakes in my kids. That's not the mower's job. So we have to find somebody else to do the leaves and the grass. Is that my liability? Yes, as a board, if a child got bit, that's your liability. So maintenance. That's at the extreme, but maintenance is, is part of the board. Even though it's really a staff, if you have a staff member doing it or you have it contracted, you still want to be responsible to say, you know, you throw the, the ice melt out on the sidewalks. It's really not your job. It's probably a, a maintenance person or a staff person's, or you might come out and throw the bucket of salt out there. But what happens if it's not thrown out there and someone slips and falls? It's your liability. So property, even though it's way out there compared to thinking about governing, you still need to think about it. Employment. You know, you have four or more, you're paying unemployment. Make sure that you're paying unemployment. So we should do wages on 
the tax return I-41 is not only reporting. You're responsible. You're liable for that. You may have a staff person that does that. But you still, you know, at the finance committee, I would ask, you know, is, there, is all your reports turned in on time or you close? It's, it's not, you're not checking up. You're just trying to reassure yourself. It's not so bad to ask for it. Risk management, insurance and safety. Just like that ice melt, you want to make sure that you have it for safety reasons. You don't want to cause harm for anybody and you want to make sure. And you want to make sure that you have risk insurance. And I tell all of this how to do that. We did national night out and she called our insurance company to get the back in case anybody needed to find out. And I said, make sure you get your insurance. You're always going to laugh because I told Roy to get it. We did not have a bounce house. Our insurance wouldn't cover the bounce house. We really can't tell you why. We get event insurance on a regular basis. Special events, like 25 bucks. Even though it's on city property. Municipal, we cover it. But you know, who are they going to go after? They're going to first go after the city. Then they're going to go after NBN. And then they're going to go after all the law enforcement stations. We pay $25. We can have an incident. Not a one. $25 is so I like to be cheap, but I do not get cheap on insurance. That's the thing that makes it. It's so easy. But also our alcohol when we do alcohol events. When we're drinking alcohol. Um trying to think of one that was at the Civic Center. In fact, Haley's husband, Avery, was our, our alcohol person. So it was Uh, we what is that? What was it that we did though one day that we we had to buy alcohol licensing? Well, Neighborsville and Neighborhoods is not an alcohol supplier. We're a compliance person, but we're not an alcohol person. So we had to do someone to get the license so we could sell alcohol. And I can't remember who it was. It was one of our city events, and we had yeah. to ask you guys to do it for us because the city couldn't get an alcohol. Yeah. Anyway, again, it's just risk management. It's better to have it there just in case than to have to worry about it. Records and officers with insurance, and that's what Roy really went on to. Um, if you work with a university, it's five million dollars. If you work with the county, it's three million dollars per student. And if you work with, um, I think you can get a million. We went as high, only because we went with universities and after research grants we went down that high. It's not horrible. We are talking about a five million dollar policy for three or four thousand dollars. It's a lot of money when you're talking about taking that out of your budget from insurance. But what if? And, and I'm the what if guy on that. Uh, records and officers also consumes your highest paid staff. I get a bond on top of myself. say no, there's two options. You'll have it in the minutes that you decided not to do it. That doesn't make any difference legally. You're still stuck. And when you walk out of the room, you're part of the board. So you're going to follow whatever they say. Or you can resign. I mean, if it's something that you're so adamantly against. Now, if it's Roy and I, we will argue it back and forth and we'll come to a consensus and then just keep going. Even though I disagree with it half the time, it's still Maybe not half, but but we have to as a board when you come to consensus, that's it. You can't choose and say, I like all of this, but not this piece. You have to like all. Because once you leave the board, once you leave the room of the meeting, it's still the action of the board. It's not the action of you. So you're ready to 
rate of joint point applied, this is where we were talking about um, city levels, we've already reiterated all of this. But make sure that you, you know what the mission and purpose is. I really want to work with animals. What if it's euthanizing or you know, it all depends on what your what your passion is for. So make sure that, that it fits your your skills and talents. Or maybe they really need your skills and talents. I am a horrible writer, but I have great writing skills. I have people that I can talk, but don't ask me to write because I write as I talk. So it goes into full circles and then we'll back to the same circle. So make sure, and then at the nonprofit level, what what do you what do you want to do? If you really love the historical part, get on the historical side. If you really love museums, become part of the museum. If you want to do something artistic, get with the art guild or the art council. Um, when I complain about the pothole in the street, join the street. Right? <laughs> perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Call Roy, he'll tell you. <laughs> yes. Call that person. Call Pammy, he'll tell. Conflict. Okay, this is the, my, my favorite slide of all. Conflict of interest is actually the Las Vegas picture. Um, this is perfect for Judy. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So what happens in the board meeting stays in the board meeting. I may say a lot of things that I don't want out in the board. You know, hopefully it's during an executive committee meeting or hopefully um, you know, not having to follow the funding rules. But this is what happens stage. Your discussions, your opinions, your healthy debates are where you stay as you can be. It's really important that you build that camaraderie and that comfort level that you can say things, say things that are valuable to the group. Now, if I just say, Tammy, I don't like you, period. That doesn't help any board. It doesn't help get the personnel out of I do love this. I may disagree with you horribly. That's why I pick on Roy because we have we are very confident in our opinion, and we do so. Right? So trust, respect, and nurture those opinions. Sometimes nurturing an opinion, you know, you may never have liked raisins in your life, and the only reason why I pick raisins is my grandson hates raisins. All of a sudden, he likes raisins. I don't know how that changed. So it's nurturing the opinion. It's nurturing. Maybe you said, I am never going to have another event, X, Y, Z, period. Maybe it's, I am never going to use that financial planner again. And after talking to them and having healthy discussions, why they want to do that, you know, you respect their knowledge, you, you, you trust them. Maybe they just need to teach you something more than what you know. So then your annual acceptance and disclosure of member accomplish. We're going to go into that next week. I'll accomplish it because I'm only going to do a real short part of it. Um, but the actual versus perceived. It's really not a conflict, and help me Roy. It's not a conflict if you're not financially gained from it. Right? That's probably the perceived. I own stock in XYZ. So I'm going to promote everybody to, to take that stock and do something. Are you really going to be able to that? But it's that actual perceived discussion. Ten responsibilities. This is at the board. What does each of you do? You know, determine mission and purposes. Select the executive director. You support the executive you ensure effective organization planning, aka strategic planning, year long planning. Ensure adequate resources. Do you have enough money to do what you're going to do? Do you have enough manpower to do what you're going to do? Do you have enough supplies? Adequate resources. Don't ask me to send out 40 handouts when you only have 20 pieces of paper. 
or have a copier and they never provide me with Managing effectively, let's do finance. Determine monitor strength and programming services. If you're doing the same thing that you did 10 years ago, the world has changed dramatically in 10 years. So strengthen your programs and your services. If you haven't if you haven't looked at what you're doing and tweaked them or at least looked at them, I mean think about it. On your phone, Facebook is now our news feed. I mean, when we look out to advertise anywhere or to tell anybody what we're doing, we do it on Facebook. We don't call the Phoenix and say, hey, you know, I'd love for that to happen. But their readership is about 3,500. Facebook, what's going on in Muskogee has 35,000. Think of, think of, who am I going to reach first and fastest? Or get those little blue check marks. <laughs> We're going to be influencers. And I just learned about that. I'm so proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> Enhance the organization's public image. This is my challenge before Mason. I should say to Mason for him. He's not for Mason. I am not a good. I can tell you all about neighbors building neighborhoods. I can tell you what we do, but I am not going to go say, look at what I did. I wish I could do that more than anything in the world. I wish I could stand up here and say, I've done this. That's not me. I, I try really hard. I can tell you about neighbors building neighborhoods and the passion that I have for that, but I am not, I'm not a look at me person. Mason has been charged with this for bless his heart. I'm an old girl with it. Entrenched roots. And this doesn't work. So, but we can enhance the public image. We're going to hear a lot about NBN in the next. We're going to be slowly sneaking up. We have an identity crisis, and that's really part of that. How many knew that the nonprofit resource center in Neighbors Building Neighborhoods was the same thing? It is. <laughs> the problem was Neighbors Building Neighborhoods was founded because of a we received grant from the city in 2000, 1997. 2006, um, Mike Ruby, not an OG in the Mike Ruby, but Mike Ruby, who lives in Muskogee, who has his three siblings, or the three children of Professor Lucy, the Ruby Russell, Mike Ruby, 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 they gave us he willed us his IRA, so we received about $150,000, and that's how. Neighbors Building Neighborhoods was founded. Um, that's how the Nonprofit Resource Center was founded. It was founded to provide resources for the community. So it's the umbrella, as everybody always hears me say, it's one of the umbrella spines of Neighbors Building Neighborhoods, the Nonprofit Resource Center. So when I was hired 12 years ago, we talked about being the Nonprofit Resource Center and never about Neighbors Building Neighborhoods. We've now completely flipped over to talk about NBN and all. Our training resources can fall under neighbors building neighborhoods just fine. But that's so if you haven't seen that change over there, that's what that's why we brand. Yeah. So that's enhancing. Ensuring legal and ethical integrity and maintaining accountability. You know, be transparent as possible. It doesn't hurt my feelings and all of you come and want to see our minutes. It doesn't hurt my feelings if you want to see our bylaws. Shame on you, you have to hide your documents. It's kind of standard. If you're not going to show your documents, shame on you. Because you should be able to be transparent. Now, that's not telling, I'm not telling you everybody's salaries. I'm not telling you anything that's critically personal. But you should be able to see all payroll, not payroll, all minutes, all financials. You're going to see a profit and loss on the balance sheet. I'm not going to show you my bill. But if you really wanted to, you'll see my salary on a 990. You'll see the majority of my salaries on staff on the grants because we have to close those out. So you kind of. But ethical integrity to make sure you do that. You do it for the good reason, don't do it for the wrong reason. Recruit and orient new board members. Board 
would he do for the orientation of being involved in for him? Almost, almost. You could do this in a short board meeting, board orientation, about 45 minutes. And then assess your board. You ask your, your, your staff to do performance reviews for themselves to make sure they're doing outcomes. Is your board doing outcomes? Why not? Why are you not? Do they do their checklist? So some job descriptions. General expectation of board members, prepare and participate in board committees. Be there. And be there mentally as well as physically. A good board member is not doing this the entire time. I promise. I promise. I promise. Because you're going to miss discussions. You're going to miss my eyes rolling. You're going to miss somebody else's eyes rolling. You know, you may be saying yes, but your face is not saying yes. To me, that's almost as important as being understanding. And I think it's important as well for as a board member to get to know your executive director as well. Um, if you just see them once a month or once a quarter and you really don't visit or you just go in and rubber, you know, stamp the minutes and the financials and you go on, you're not doing your job as a board member either, and that executive director is not doing their job as well. Because they may be I've learned too over the years is some of those board members come in and they're afraid to ask those questions, but if they have that question, five other people in the room probably have that question. So those visits one-on-one uh, -on -one are really important. Copy. Copy on one-to-one. -one. Make sure everybody knows. Sometimes it's just helpful to be outside of the, the meeting as well. You know, if you review your board packet and you really have a question, call. Yes. Are board meetings open to the public? Some are open to the public. Open meetings and open records rules. If you and this is and I'm gonna get corrected, so just hold on so you can understand the right. My mind, if I'm receiving any federal state funds, I have to follow open meetings and open records. I'm thinking about the confidentiality issues. So if you have acquired this with your board and you're discussing those confidentiality. You can go into executive session if it's on your agenda, but you need to go over personnel issues would be confidential, any legal issues help me. Yep. Any legal issues that would be happening. Um, but I'm I'm still the transparent. I mean, I'm not gonna say, oh, I fired Lindsay Roberts in front of the whole world because she didn't do something. That is not going to be in my minutes. We have five years, sorry. Um, not yet. Not, <laughs> meetings in three weeks, no. I don't want her job, so she's, she has a job security thing. Um, but you might want to talk about bidding. If you're doing a bid for a project, you want that to be open. You want it to be transparent. Um, I'm trying to think of things that I mean, think of a city council. They talk about everything in the world in the meeting. It's probably more than what you think about happening. But on a board, your committees do the, the work. So you're really, your board should be, your board meeting should be short because your committees have done all the work. So you're not going to have that discussion. You might. But I have people that have served on finance committee that didn't need to be on finance committee only because they wanted to learn more about it. And so that's where the discussion happens is in that committee. And then you bring the decision to the board or the recommendation. The recommendation to the board and the board approves it. And sometimes during a board meeting, they'll ask questions. But if it's too many questions, my board chairs in the past have just said, I suggest that you go to the next finance committee where you just go in depth and look at it. They don't want to slap your hand, but they certainly want to say, this is not the place to talk about that. You know, it's really that's why why committees are important. That's where you, those are not held to open access in our industry. But that's where you can get a little more transparency, especially with finance. I have a, a, had a finance person that wanted to know how much I paid for light bulbs at one time. Truly, I'm sitting with you. He was no longer a light bulb. 
So it's very different than other people, but we're still grant funded that, like right now, I have 10, I have 10 openings if anybody wants to come work. They're all part-time, you have to live in small cities, but it's $17,500 for a 20-hour job or $35,000 for a full-time job. You have to live in Ann or it's OK or Oktaha or Adair or ten little tiny cities, and you need your community organizers. Well, the board did not give me authority to do that. The University, Emory University did not do that. So this is a question of who's doing that. But if you want more about that information, you should come to the board. But the fiduciary responsibility is also making sure that you have enough money to pay everybody. Enough money to pay for, um, for staff. Are you stretching? No, you're fine. I can stretch too. I need it just as much. Um, pay for staff, pay utilities, you got to have enough money to pay your electric bills. Okay. Thank goodness for PPP, how many people used that last year? I mean, I'm so thankful for that. But that was my board's responsibility to say, yes, let's go apply for that. It wasn't just some lynch thing. Oh, I need to go apply for that. Or if you have reserves, we're in the pool for that. Yes. Say, I think today's a good day. Let's cash that CD down. down. <laughs> I can't. I can't pay my copier bills. You know, those are the kind. You know, or what kind of um, personnel perks are you going to benefit? So you're going to have. That's really a good personnel committee for personnel. We give. Um, how many students in the last year died? Um, health benefits. We pay, if you go to the gym two hours during your work week, we will pay for your membership for the year each month. Okay. Um, this one here. Well, it's only $27. Think what a great perk that is as an employee to let somebody, you're going to, you know, how many times have you worked more than 40 hours? So, I mean, let's be serious. But we, we do health and benefits that way. We pay half of medical because. I don't want six people in my building, so I'm going to make sure that I pay for that. Businesses do that. Why can't nonprofits do that? So that's really, when the board starts looking at those things, cash your CD for profits. Um, responsibility. You're going to act as an ambassador for the organization when the public can only be one voice outside the board room. This is Judy. I did not like that decision. That is not the place to ever say that again. You can say it in the, in the room, you say, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong, but I'm going to agree to disagree, but I'm taking some steps. Does this have any? No, I, I have an occasion where I was the lone dissenter on, I was the board chair, and I was the lone dissenter, and I had to go to, uh, on a committee that had some level of decision making authority, we had to get approval from. Uh, a higher committee. In this case, it was the Bar Association Board of Governors. And so my committee voted to do something. I was opposed to it. I voted no. So I went to the committee and presented our position, even though I opposed it. 
So one of the board members said, do you believe this is a good idea? <laughs> and I, you know, yeah. And, and so, you know, recognizing what my responsibility was, I said, on behalf of the committee, yes, I do. But Kim Lynch would not think Yeah, I did, but I, I you know, carried the party line because that's what my obligation was as the chair and leader of the organization. It's a really hard thing to do, Kim. It's a really hard thing to do. You really want to disagree with somebody. Or as we, as Heather and I sat and said, no, how many times can we you say no and people still are going to go forward? So that's the challenge of being on a committee versus being on a city council or a committee versus being on a board. You can say no and the hierarchy. I'm going to figure out kind of board role and appropriate. This is a perfect example of food boxes. If you want to want to volunteer for food boxes, please come do that on Thursday. Fred, Mason and I won't be there on Thursday for that food box. Oh, good. Two of us won't be there for that. Oh, no. We're and I won't be there the next Thursday because of the food. Well, I won't be there either. Huh? Oh, what? If you'd like to volunteer for that, there's sign up. <laughs> it's actually it's actually fun and it's very rewarding. So. But it's not at a board meeting. So I mean it, and it's like doing the teachers things or national night out or whatever every other event, going to the chamber banquet. There are things that you do outside of your little board meetings that, that will enhance your board involvement of that particular event. It'll engage you in Feeling, getting the passion and the mission of the organization. Um, it's important too because if you, as a board member, if you don't attend those things or you're not involved, and then staff comes and says, We want to kill this event or this program, you have no clue why or why they want to do that. So if you're like, Yeah, I went to that, it was bad, yep, let's go ahead and get rid of it, or no, it was really good, I think we should improve upon it or maybe whatever it might be. Um, it is good to get involved with something that is outside the board meeting as well. Also, I want to add so, even even like sharing, like you use food box as an example. Even sharing that is you're you're speaking. I, I share that I'm supporting my community and I'm supporting neighbors with me. So I'm sharing that on Thursday at three o'clock and have a food box to food box. Three hundred boxes. Yeah, to anybody. It's not. Anyway, sharing those things on Facebook and saying no, they're saying you can't be there to actually talk about the box and share it. And I think that, that again, that's the non criminal human piece of this, the being out there and telling people what the organization is. And I don't care that I'm not there or I'm there. I care that we're serving 300 people, 300 families, thanks to CD. Just appropriate committee possible nominees or board members include Mason and Mason and then the trustees and the commissioners. So, what this basically says is, is you know, if you know a big, big bunch of money and they don't want to serve on a board but you still want to connect to them, discuss those names. And it doesn't always have to be the chairman of the board, it certainly can be somebody else that's on that, on that committee or on that organization or in that business. Um, because a significant contribution to me may be $100. A significant contribution of a community organization could be $10,000. <laughs> um, but part of that is, I believe that you either give money or you get money or you get off the board. Coming from an organization that I had to ask for money every day of my life for 27 years. Every day I would walk into a meeting and they'd say, what do you want now? Well, I only need you to buy 20 pieces of paper and give me $500 so the scholarship for the girls to go to school next fall, whatever. And that became my, it was a lovely, lovely job. And it was a great career, but I so loved now that I 
guys, can you just write the grant with the picture? Because uh, I can walk into our room without feeling guilty. Now, soon, we will need you to come up and I'll do the Or we need board members that need to be engaged in something. Um, I think it's making that meaningful donation. So fostering hope. You may not have $100 or you may not want to give trash, but you're going to go buy clothes or supplies to donate to that. So if that's more important to you than writing the check, then that's important as well to your but donation. Those donations don't keep your lights on. So I can see this is real people. I still need the dollars to pay the lights. Unless you want to get OG Link to sponsor you. <laughs> They're still not going to pay your lights. You still need that significant gift as well as that donation. That significant gift doesn't have to get this level, but all those twenty dollars and either membership or whatever helps you pay lights. Now it's also important to make sure like I said on the quality of life committee, we look at those when we get those grants, we want to know well why are those board members not contributing? You know, if they can't support it, why should we support them? So And I think that if you're gonna be significant on the board, you need to give something. I'm not telling you that you have to give them There was one board, I know we're running short of time, but there was one board that this is a rare case, but it can happen. It, they got on this board and they were asked to make a $250 donation, and that was part to pay for their DNO insurance. Oh. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 that should be a budgeted item. So if you get on the board and they ask for that, that's a red flag right there. And then on top of that, they had to make another you know, $100 donation or whatever. So little things. Like that, you may ask questions for if someone says this is what it's for. Ask questions. <laughs> I think that the board has to be careful with asking for substantial money, especially if you want other people to have been invested in your career or if you're right out of college. You might not have the means, but you have the time, the passion, and the dedication, plus the other skills can be monetized, right? So if you are an expert in social media, which most 22 Well, and I, th I think that's why you use the word meaningful and not substantial. Yeah. You know, you're not going to Starbucks and getting a $5 coffee drink and you give me that $5, I'm okay with that. You know, we used to use, when I was that age, we used to use a basket and just have the basket at the board meeting. Everybody put their, their spare change in there. It's a way to get 100% contribution. Not the best, but it helps. But you, yes, I agree. We laughed about this. We laughed so hard because I said there is no way that I'm going to take two hours and decide. So this is a little quiz. Lincoln, my youngest of six, my grandchild. Yay! But whose role is it? It's a two pager because Roy needed to be able to read it. You can you can do this at your leisure. Bring it back next to me and we'll give you the test or maybe we'll do it separately. But the chief elected officer is your board chair or your president, the elected person. If that helps your board directors with your city council, if that's what you're, you're trying to do citywide, mayor, city council, city manager, and staff. It makes you think. I don't want to get people to think this is me. Since I lied and forgot them. So the last part of this is it's a good session. How many board members do you have that are going to roll off? You want to make a plan. You don't want everybody to roll off at the same time. Think about your historical data. Think about your historical information. You know, if you had 10 members, Eight of them come off. Let's hope that the last two are, have some good data. Hopefully they kept that information because they shared it. 
I cannot imagine. We do a third and third of six. That's how we kind of roll off. Um, we assign mentors. Um, not a very good job of that. That's one thing we are not very good at, but we need to get better. We need to. Sometimes people come on board, and since we have such odd board meeting times, it doesn't always fit. Using the matrix of domains, if you take that matrix and then pull it out to who or what or change it with these or your special skills or expertise, it's real easy. You just go over to the top with your board members and find out what they've done. You can take 15 minutes at a board meeting and do that. Pass it around, make it natural. And then you find what skills, so if you find your need, you need that 18 to 29 year old Asian. Hard to find. That's 18 to 29 year old. And so then what skills do you need from your strategic plan? Hopefully you've done one. I do not believe in three to five strategic plans. I really like 18 months for strategic plans. 18 months gives you enough to kind of focus forward so that you can see the things that happen. If you do a three to five year strategic plan, I, you know, five years ago, do you know what's happening today? No. Or you just roll it continuously. You could do a five year and put some big benchmarks on it. So when you have that strategic plan, which is another whole discussion, what skills do you need? We need the Haley three year. We need the, you know, we didn't need that five years ago. Five years ago, we probably were kind of busy. We were all refreshing our pockets. Um, what are the great skills? I'm thinking of other things that you wouldn't have needed five years ago or three years ago. Maybe your mission has kind of tweaked a little bit. Your purpose has to stay true. Your mission has to stay true. And broad. And then training. Always, always provide training. Chambers are training. And then your leadership. Nothing is worse. Is probably I haven't been that. I've been very fortunate that usually your vice chair or one of your leadership roles can roll up. Um, nothing is worse than all of your leadership leaves. Who's going to run your organization? It's a partnership with any staff member. But who's going to be the board chair? Who's going to be the president? If somebody gets transferred, because I've lived that life before, they get transferred out of state, who's going to jump into it? Who's going to be that person? Hopefully, you've created somebody, worked with somebody, with you to your future, that can jump in and I was late, so I did <laughs> That's my contact stretch. Next week, you're going to get Angela and Crystal. And Crystal's from Big Sea Chamber of Commerce. And they're doing a lot of this, but more in 